week has come and gone, but thanks be to God for He has safely guided us through this week and into another Sabbath day. Happy Sabbath, Fairhaven's Church family, and welcome to our friends who are worshiping with us today. This past week, some of us might have experienced some answered prayers, while some might have experienced some challenges. But through it all, God remains good and faithful to each one of us. As we have been reminded as a church family this past Sabbath, God remains to be trustworthy. And through it all, we can be super conquerors through Christ. According to Prophet Jeremiah in Lamentations chapter 3, he said, Because of the Lord's great love, we are not consumed, for His compassions never fail. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. The Lord is good to those whose hope is in Him, to the one who seeks Him. So today, as we continue to seek, to trust, and to place our hope in God, let us also praise Him for His unfailing love and for His never-ending compassion towards us. Let us also show our thankfulness through proper stewardship of His blessings. Let us watch this short video clip about trusting God with our resources and putting Him first in all aspects of our life. Josiah and Denise decided to put God first despite their fear and uncertainty about the future. That's when their transformation began. What can we learn from their story today that will help us put God first in our own lives? Josiah and Denise were highly successful in business. They decided to participate in God's work by investing their savings in building a Seventh-day Adventist church. And that's when things started to go wrong. Business started to drop off, leaving them with basically no options to move forward. But despite the circumstances and the risk of losing everything, the couple put God first and continued to invest in the church building. Their friends called them crazy, but they were convicted of their decision. We tend to believe that things will go well when we put God first and we will be shielded from adversity. But in reality, putting God first is acknowledging that God is molding our lives for the better through good and bad times. Understanding that it is vital to allowing the Holy Spirit to work in us and keep us faithful in times of adversity and uncertainty. Josiah and Denise often visited the construction site and spent hours there watching the people work. Even with all their fears and concerns, they would feel an inexplicable peace that reassured them that they were doing the right thing no matter the consequences. The situation was getting more complicated every day. They were in an unsustainable position. The bank had set a date to repossess their car and home, leaving them with nowhere to go and no way to get there. How far would God allow this to continue? Three days before the repossessions were set to happen, God stepped in. Josiah was awarded a large contract, providing them with the resources they would need to move on. The church building is now complete, and people worship God there every week. Josiah and Denise's business is booming again, and their financial concerns are in the past. They continue to sponsor and support other projects as God leads. Ellen White wrote about this. What if some become poor in investing their means in the work? Christ, for your sakes, became poor, but you are securing for yourselves eternal riches, a treasure in heaven that faileth not. Your means is far safer there than if deposited in the bank or invested in houses and lands. It is laid up in bags that are not old. No thief can approach it. No fire consumes it. Josiah and Denise put God first. Their faith inspires us today. Jesus gave up everything to redeem us, and His love compels us to put His kingdom first in our own lives. As we return the tithe and our promise offering, we are challenged to put God first. Our speaker today has spoken to us once before. He is currently a student at Andrews University, double majoring in theology and sociology. He is currently the religious vice president for the Andrews University Student Association. He is also the student chaplain there. 
Our speaker today is 20 years old and has been preaching for about 11 years now. He is from Ann Arbor, Michigan, and his name is Chase Wilder. To call our attention and focus our thoughts towards worshiping him who is worthy of our adoration and praise, let us read from Isaiah chapter 12, verses 4 to 6. Isaiah 12, 4 to 6. Give thanks to the Lord, call on his name, make known among the nations what he has done, and proclaim that his name is exalted. Sing to the Lord, for he has done glorious things. Let this be known to all the world. Shout aloud and sing for joy, people of Zion, for great is the Holy One of Israel among you. For our hymn of adoration, let us sing, When He Cometh. When he cometh, when he cometh to make up his jewels, all his jewels, precious jewels, his love and his own. Like the stars of the morning, his brightness adorning, they shall shine in their beauty, bright gems for his crown. He will gather, he will gather the gems for his kingdom. All the pure ones, all the bright ones, his love and his own. Like the stars of the morning, his brightness adorning. They shall shine in their beauty, bright gems for his crown. Little children, little children, who love the Redeemer, are the jewels, precious jewels, His love and His own. Like the stars of the morning, His brightness adorning, they shall shine in their beauty, bright gems for His crown. Let us pray. Most gracious and loving Heavenly Father, the source of everything that we have, our life, our joy, our trials and hard times that strengthen our faith, and through it all, it just made us more dependent on you. Because you never leave us, nor forsake us, and I praise you and thank you for that. I also thank you for the success of our 15th anniversary program, for the strength and wisdom that you gave to our leaders. They were and are untiringly working hand in hand for the fulfillment of your work, which is to preach to all the world, even after our anniversary. Father, I continuously pray for our situation. COVID-19 is lingering for so long now and all of your children are affected. I humbly come before you to request that you please continue to protect us, assured us that in all this, you will be with us even until the end of the age. For those still unemployed at this time, Please take away their worries. Use us, your people, to be a blessing to them. Assure them that you care for them and will sustain them. For those who are sick, continue to give them strength and hope. For those grieving, please comfort us and assure us that someday soon we will be reunited in a place where there's no more sorrow and no more pain, that all we will experience is pure love and joy, that you are true to your promise, that you will wipe away all tears, and there shall be no more death, neither sorrow nor crying. I also pray for our children, those beside us, 
as well as those away from us. Please guide and protect them. Please give them wisdom in everything that they do. Keep them as the apples of your eyes and hide them in the shadow of your wings. For our students in school and online, may they continue to gain the knowledge that they need. It's the stress that come their way. May their light shine at school and wherever they go. That your character be seen in them. I also pray for our seniors. Please make them feel that you are renewing their life and sustaining their strength each and every day. Continue to assure them that you will carry them and deliver them even from the COVID-19. I also pray for our speaker today, our brother Chase Wilder. Please hide him behind the cross. May the words of his mouth and the meditation of his heart be acceptable into your sight. And for us, the listening brethren, may we come out from the service renewed and ready to be of service. Please forgive us for we are all sinners. And I ask all of this in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Good morning and happy Sabbath, everyone. Well, the guy we're going to talk about today, he had a lot to do with taxes back when Jesus was around. And he was hated. I don't just mean disliked. I mean hated. You know why? He was a tax collector. God's story, Zacchaeus. So part of God's story is about Zacchaeus, and it begins like this. Once there was a man named Zacchaeus, let's call him Zach, who lived in a town called Jericho. He was short, and he didn't have many friends. In fact, most people hated Zach. That's because he worked as a tax collector. See, back then people paid taxes, just like now. But instead of sending money to the government, there were men in every city whose job was taking tax money from people. Problem is, those men usually lied. Zach like most, took a lot of extra money from a lot of people, and all those people hated him. Anyway, one day Jesus came to Zach's town, and Zach wanted to see him, but so did everybody else. And remember how Zach was really short? Well, he couldn't see Jesus over everybody else's head. So guess what he did? He actually climbed up into a tree to look out over everybody. Now, imagine a grown man climbing up in a tree in the middle of a crowd. People probably thought he was crazy, or weird. But Zach was willing to look weird if it meant getting closer to Jesus. From up in the tree, Zach watched as Jesus walked up. Jesus said, Zacchaeus, hurry down. Today is my day to be a guest in your home. This was kind of like a famous person inviting themselves over, except way better. This invitation would change Zach's life. Zach scrambled down the tree to take Jesus to his house. Maybe he thought Jesus didn't know about all the money he had taken, or how everybody hated him. But Jesus did know, and he loved Zach anyways. Other people saw this, and they were mad. They said, Jesus has gone into the house of a sinner. They wondered how Jesus could love somebody who had lied and stole their money. The great thing is, Jesus loves all of us, even after we've done things we deserve to get in trouble for, or even after we actually get in trouble. 
When we see that Jesus loves us anyway, it makes us want to show that kind of love to others. At least that's what happened to Zach. Right away, he wanted to make things right with the people he had hurt. He knew that just saying, I'm sorry, wasn't enough. So he told Jesus, I'm going to give half of what I have to the poor, and anyone I cheated, I will pay back four times the amount of money I took. When Jesus saw that Zach was willing to accept his love and turn around and show it to others, he said, My friend, today God has rescued you. And even though Zach had been a liar and a thief who was hated by everyone, he became a friend of Jesus and a part of God's family that very day. And that's the story of Zacchaeus. Zacchaeus teaches us that when you make a solid effort to experience Jesus, you are rewarded. It means seeking Him with all your heart and doing everything He would have you do. The scripture reading for today is found in John 14, verses 1 to 3. Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself. That where I am, there you may be also. May the Lord bless the scripture. Time just leaps away and there's a loop that all the years. Memories of happiness and bitter tears. Through it all the rays a common friend that cannot be ignored. You were there teaching me to be a servant.
Happy Sabbath, everyone. It's my privilege to be worshiping with you all today. I want to greet you all in the name of Jesus, and I want to send you the most heartfelt Sabbath blessings all the way from Andrews University, which is where I currently study. I also want to thank your pastor and your youth director for the invitation to preach this weekend. It is my privilege and I'm so truly blessed to have this opportunity to be with you and to worship with you, even though it's via the internet. I hope that sometime I might be able to travel to Canada to visit you all and to meet you all in person so that we can worship and fellowship together. I also want to commend you and thank you to the families and to the members of this church because you have done such a wonderful job and you have produced some of my closest friends. Uh, some of your members who are currently studying with me here at Andrews are truly a blessing to me, those being Shadrach, Sandrine, Chloe, and others. So I want to thank you for the richness that your church possesses. I want to preach now, and I want to jump right into it, as we don't need to waste any time when we are studying the Word of God. In fact, the Word is more important than anything else that I have to say. So I think we ought to jump right into the Word of God. If you have your Bibles, I wish for you to turn to the book of Genesis. Genesis is where I plan on preaching today, and I want to look at the third chapter. Genesis chapter 3, and let's begin with verse 6. Genesis chapter 3 and verse 6. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was pleasant to the eyes, a tree desired to make one wise, she took of the fruit thereof and did eat and gave also unto her husband and he did eat. Then the eyes of them both were open and they knew that they were naked. So they sold fig leaves together and made themselves coverings. And they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord amongst the trees of the garden. Then the Lord called to Adam and said to him, where are you? Where are you? In fact, I want to preach from that subject today. Where are you? You know the story. You know of Adam and Eve and their wonderful time that they had in the Garden of Eden. God created them perfect, without fault. In Genesis chapter 1 and reading from, I believe it's the 31st verse, the Bible says that God looked at everything that he had made on the sixth day and saw that it was very good. That word very intensifies the emotion. That word very makes it more good than it was. So in other words, God is saying it was better than good. It was perfect. He made the light and the trees and the sun and the moon and the stars. He made the fish and the birds. He made animals. It was perfect. But he took time when he made Adam and Eve, paused for a minute and looked the father, looked at the son and then looked at the Holy Spirit and said, let us make man in our image after our likeness. No other being can claim such a close connection with God as Adam and Eve were because they bore, they possessed the image of God. 
Psalms recording this speaks of it this way, saying, What is man? The Lord, you are mindful of him, or the son of man, that you visited him. Uh, you have made him a little lower than the angels. But you crowned him with glory and honor. God had richly blessed Adam and Eve. But Adam and Eve chose another way. They chose to follow another power. They chose Satan over God. Now, now don't, don't get tripped up by what I just said, because you and I do the same thing each and every day. Every time we choose sin, instead of choosing Christ, we have chosen another path. Every time you and I cling to sin more than we cling to Jesus, we have chosen another path. This is the truth. And so we cannot judge Adam and Eve more than we judge ourselves because the same mistake that Adam made is the same mistake you and I make each and every day. The same deception that Eve fell for is the same deception that you and I fall for all the time. This is why the Bible can say there is none righteous, no, not one. All have come short of the glory of God. There is none good, no, not one. All found in the book of Romans chapter 3. None of us can claim perfection because we're all sinners. And we need to recognize that. No matter how many Sabbaths we keep, no matter how much uh, vegetarian food we may eat, no matter how many times we return a faithful tithe, that does not change the fact that we are a sinner. And while all of these things are things we must do, deep down we still struggle with the problem called sin. Adam and Eve chose another path. They chose another way. And the Bible says that they opened their eyes and knew that they were naked. After choosing this path, after choosing this way contrary to God, they then experienced shame. In the book of Genesis and the second chapter, nakedness is always associated with shame. In fact, all throughout scripture, God makes it plain that, that, that when he will uncover their nakedness, that means he will expose their shame. And so now Adam and Eve are living in this guilty position. They are living in this shameful position and they just don't know what to do. So they decide to go hide themselves amongst the trees of the garden. This is what sin does to us. It causes us to be so shameful that instead of running to God, we run from God. Many of us are in that position right now. Instead of coming to Christ, begging him for forgiveness and begging him for his grace and mercy, we run from him. I want to change our conception today of who God is. Let me say something that is truth from the Bible. First John reading from the third chapter, the Bible makes it plain that God is love. The scriptures make it plain that God is love. John chapter 14 and verse 6, the Bible speaking of God, who is Jesus, says that he is the way, the truth, and the life. And in John 5 and verse 30, 39, it says that we must search the scriptures, for in them we think that we have eternal life. But these scriptures testify of who Jesus is. I want to connect all of those passages. God is love, and Christ is God. Therefore, Christ must be love. But the Bible also makes another assertion that the Bible, the purpose of the scriptures is to reveal truth and Christ is truth. Now, if Christ is love and Christ is truth, then that means the purpose of the scriptures is to reveal the truth about Jesus. And the truth is that he is love. In other words, when we read the book of Genesis, the purpose is to not make us feel worse about our condition, but the purpose is to make us feel better about who God is. It is to reveal to us the truth of Christ's love. And in the book of Genesis, despite the sin that Adam and Eve just committed, we can rest assured that God is still good and God is still love. Bible says it very plain that as Adam and Eve are trying to run away from God and hide themselves amongst the trees of the garden, the, 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 the Bible says that they heard the voice, they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden. 
In other words, that is to say that when Adam and Eve sinned, he did not leave them to handle their sin by themselves, but instead he chose to come down from heaven and to find his children. He left the courts of heaven and came to come see about his children. This is exactly what Jesus did 2,000 years ago. As he saw humanity struggling in the depths of sin, as he saw humanity rotting away and, and, and defiling themselves and turning their backs on each other and causing pain and strife with each other. As he saw this, God was not comfortable sitting up in heaven and just watching humanity waste themselves away. But instead, he decided to come down from heaven. He decided to leave the courts of angelic hosts. He decided to leave his glorious throne. He decided to leave the presence of his father. And he came down to humanity, became a man, walked among men, and then died on a cross for us. God came down to come see about us. And that's exactly what we find in the book of Genesis. Just when Adam and Eve sinned, that's when God shows up. And so it is with you when you're at your lowest point, that's when God shows up. When you turn your back on God, that's when God is trying to reach you the most. When we refuse to accept Christ, that's when God sends his Holy Spirit more than he sent it before because he's desperate to save us. They heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the cool of the garden in the middle of the day and Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord but then the Bible says that God called so first he came but second he called I love the Bible because everywhere in Scripture you can learn a new truth about Jesus and so the first truth that we learn is that Christ came the second truth that we learn is that Christ calls after he comes down to humanity and sees Adam and re recognizes that Adam is hiding, the Bible says he calls unto him. Now, let's make it plain. God knows exactly where Adam is. He knows what Adam's done. He knows what Eve has done. He knows they're trying to hide, but he wants to make it known that he's searching for Adam. He wants to make it clear that he's looking for Adam, not to judge him. Make no mistake. The first thing that God says to Adam and Eve is a promise. And that promise is that he's going to save them in the end. So God's purpose is not to judge him. That's what it says in John 3 and verse 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. But verse 17 says, God sent not his son to condemn the world, but that through him the world might be saved. God is not trying to condemn. He's trying to save. Now, that means he'll convict us of sin. That means he'll cause us to repentance and he'll reprove us for our sins. But his primary purpose is not to condemn, but to save. He came, but then he calls. And like he called Adam in the Garden of Eden, saying, where are you? The same call that he's giving is he that he gave to him is the same call that he gives to us. He calls us saying, where are you? And some of us can respond where we are. Some of us may be in the pit of sin, but God is still calling. Some of us may be in a period of doubting, but God is still calling. Some of us may be in pain. Some of us may be in distress. Some of us may be suffering, but God is still calling. Some of us may be sitting in the pews of church, going through the emotions of religion outwardly, but God is calling because he wants to live within. To each and every one of us, God sends a call. And that call is the call of salvation. First, he came. Second, he called. And third, I want to skip now. As the text goes on, Adam says he heard the voice of God in the garden in verse 10. And because of what he heard, he says he was afraid. Because he was naked. So Adam decided to hide himself. Now that's quite interesting. Because up until this point, Adam has never had negative dealings with God. So the question is, who told Adam that he needed to be afraid of God? I, I bring that up right now because that's an important point. Who told us we needed to be afraid of God? 
In our sinful state, we think that God is just trying to judge us. In our broken state, we think God is a tyrant. Who told us that we need to be afraid of God? The Bible says God is love. The Bible says his mercy endures forever. The Bible says that the Lord is not slack concerning his promise, but he's patient with us, not willing that any should perish, but all might come to repentance. Who told us to be afraid of God? God accepts us with open arms. Now notice that when he accepts us, he does not keep us the same way we came, but he accepts us just as we are. But we must recognize when we leave Christ, we will not leave as we came, but we'll leave better because we have met Jesus. He came, he called, but then I want to skip to the end of the chapter. Because God gives all these promises and he gives all these instructions. And then he tells them that you're going to suffer some things in life because of sin. That's the truth. Sin will always cause suffering. We need to accept that fact. But despite what sin will cause, listen to what the Bible says in verse 20. And Adam called his wife's Eve, name Eve, because she was the mother of all living. Verse 21, also for Adam and his wife, the Lord God made coats of skin and covered them. Let me read it again. To Adam and to his wife also, the Lord God made coats of skin and covered them. I have many questions. Uh, why did God have to cover them in coats of skin? That's number one. Number two, where did the skin come from? Number three, what is this? What does this mean? What's going on? Listen, the skin always came from the skin of an animal. In other words, in order for Adam and Eve to receive the skin of the animal to cover them, that animal had to die. I want you all to stay with me because I don't want this to be lost. I want this to make sense because this is the most beautiful point of the story. Something had to die in order for Adam and Eve to be covered. Something had to die in order for Adam and Eve to be clothed. And so it is like you and I, someone had to die in order for us to be covered. The Bible says that the lamb that was slain every single day in Israel, from Genesis all the way to Matthew, the lamb that was slain represented Jesus, who was to be the lamb that was slain for us. And that same lamb that was slain for us, he uses his blood and covers us. Uh, the Bible says with his blood, he covers us. With his righteousness, he covers us. With his perfection, Christ covers us. And so it is, God came, God called, but then he covered. I need to illustrate this coverage thing for a minute. I learned after having some car trouble in the past few weeks that the best thing you need is good coverage. In fact, when you get in trouble, you got to make sure you're fully insured. I learned that car insurance <laughs> is quite expensive. <laughs> I learned that in order to make sure that your car is properly dealt with, just in case you get in a bad situation, you need to get the best insurance plan possible because you never know what could possibly take place. Uh, now, some of us have expensive car insurance. Some of us have the basic car insurance plan. But I want to make it plain today, I don't have just car insurance, but I have life insurance. And my life insurance is a man by the name of Jesus Christ. He has covered me completely. And though I may be in the pits of sin, I know I'm insured because Jesus can save me from the pits of sin. Though I may be in the worst situation possible, I have life insurance and I know that down here I may walk on concrete, but up there I walk on streets of gold. <laughs> I have life insurance and down here I may live in a dorm at Andrews University, but up there I have the confidence that I have a mansion in heaven. I have life insurance. I am insured. I'm fully covered. I know that one day I'm going to be in glory with heaven. And I have this insurance and assurance that Jesus has the ability to save me from the madness that is this planet. So I must say it again, like Adam, he came, he called, 
and he covers. And to you and I, he does the same thing. Christ has already come. Christ has already died for humanity. Christ has already walked among men and shown us just how you and I can live. He's already done it. But right now, he's calling. Where are you? Why is he calling us? Because he not wants to know what condition we're in. He wants us to recognize what we're condition we're in so that he can make the next step, which is to cover us. And when Christ covers us, that means he takes the old sin away and covers us with the robe of his righteousness. That is the truth and the perfection of his character. He makes us better than we were before. But in order for us to get to that point, we must answer the call. God called Adam and Adam responded. Adam could have kept hiding himself. He could have kept running from God, but that would only make the situation worse. He must address the situation that he is in right now, and that is his sin. And the only way to address it is to go to Jesus. He must address the suffering that he is now struggling with. And the only way to address that is to go to Jesus. And so Jesus is calling. He's calling you and he's calling me. We struggle with sin. We struggle with uh, addictions. We struggle with suffering. But Christ is calling. He's calling you and he's calling me. Saying to us, Chase, where are you? Saying, Chase, I love you. Chase, come unto me. Chase, accept me. Chase, let me in. God is calling, but he says your name. And so today on this Sabbath, I want to extend the invitation. Somebody today wants to make the decision to accept Christ in their heart. Wherever you are, whoever you are, right now I want you to bow your head with me as we pray this prayer of commitment to accept Christ as our personal Savior, to answer the call and run to Jesus. For our hymn of consecration, let us sing when we all get to heaven. love of Jesus, seeing His mercy and His grace. In the mansions, bright and blessed, He'll prepare for us a place. When we all get to heaven, what a day of rejoicing that will be. When we all see Jesus, we'll sing and shout the victory. While we walk the pilgrim's pathway, clouds will overspread the sky. But when traveling days are over, that a shadow, not a sigh. When we all get to heaven, what a day of rejoicing that will be. When we all see Jesus, we'll sing and shout the victory. Let us then be true and faithful, trusting, serving every day. Just one glimpse on Him in glory will the toys of life repay. When we all get to heaven, what a day of rejoicing that will be. When we all see Jesus, we'll sing and shout the victory. Onward to the prize before us, soon His beauty will behold. Soon the pearly gates will open, we shall spread the streets of gold. When we all get to heaven, what a day of rejoicing that will be. When we all see 
Jesus will sing and shout the victory. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much. We thank you because you came down to this planet to save us. We thank you because you call us, trying to woo us and reach us with your Holy Spirit so that we might accept you. But most of all, we thank you because you're going to cover us. And you have given us life insurance. And that is the assurance that we can and will be saved with you in heaven. But in order to get there, we need to first accept the call. So, Lord, there's somebody here that's watching on YouTube that says they want to accept the call. Lord, seal their decision. Lord, give them the ability to strengthen your, their relationship with you. Bless them in a very special way. May they recognize and understand that Christ loves them and wants to develop a strong relationship with them. And may they be covered with the blood of Jesus and saved in your kingdom. Father, I thank you so much for this truth. This is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. May God bless you. May God cause his face to shine upon you. And most of all, may we all be gathered together to see him in the clouds of glory the one who saved us and redeemed us. Happy Sabbath. Are you in need of a prayer? We can help. Just send us an email using the email address shown below with your name and a phone number that we can reach and we would be glad to pray with you.